And of course, fairness is, appears in very fragmented places in our regulation at the moment. Um, in the fiduciary relationship, actually, fairness is right at the heart of it, as Pamela pointed out to me in one of the questions that she sent. Um, fairness in professionalism is, as John has already pointed out, very high in the importance in treating uh, the customer, putting the, cu the client first. Um, so, uh, and we of course have a license obligation to be efficient, honest and fair. So it's not a new value entirely. Uh, so I might ask Pamela to start with her point about um, uh, the fiduciary relationship and then ask John to follow on um, fairness in professionalism and perhaps Steve on the best interest duty and then we can wrap it up and we'll move on to some more detailed discussion about the product intervention powers and uh, financial product governance. Thanks, Timothy. Hello, everyone over there. I have to sit up very tall to see to over there. No, 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 I won't. Um, we, in the report, it talks about fairness as involving behaving with integrity. And one of the things that we've been thinking about through the work that we've done with the FSI is, well, when we talk about people in the financial services space acting with integrity, do we all mean the same thing? And I suspect the answer to that is no. It's a bit like the discussion that we had about what's the purpose of the superannuation system. It seems like such a basic question that you assume everybody's on the same page, but they're actually not. And we've had some thinking for a while that what I call fiduciary intermediaries, and in our space that's predominantly financial advisors and fund managers, so and investment managers, people who manage money under mandate and so on, um, that what it means for them to act with integrity is very much those kind of fiduciary or equitable values about putting the other person's interests ahead of your own, acting selflessly. They're the kind of moral drivers of that relationship. That's not necessarily true in other parts of the financial sector. So when you're talking about maybe product manufacturing and investment products, or you're talking about um, creating um, debt instruments or making loans to people, maybe what is involved in acting with integrity there is much more a sort of arm's length, um, what I might describe as a common law relationship, um, where it's all about being transparent, being accountable, keeping your promises and so on. But there's no expectation in that market relationship, if you're making an investment in a company or whatever, that they will be putting you, your interests ahead of theirs. So, Part of making sure when we talk about acting fairly towards consumers is I think we need to pull apart the different sub-relationships that sit inside the financial services sector and have a, a real discussion about, well, you know, if you're treating your customers fairly, what does that mean? And then the necessary next step is not to jump to, well, how do we regulate to produce that outcome? But for my mind, the next necessary step is to say, how is your business model not inimical to those values? And that's where we start to see the really interesting things around those fiduciary intermediary business models. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, look, I think from the, in the professional context, we talk about um, fairness and, and particularly the, um, the, the FSI inquiry's um, definition there to, uh, of um, uh, integrity, honesty and transparency and in a non-discriminatory way. I mean, I think that what aligns with some of the professional values, particularly around integrity, we talk about um, having a positive obligation around candour mm -hmm. and honesty. Mm -hmm. Candour is interesting in the, um, in the product development um, area and, and, and um, um, you know, perhaps also on the distribution side. I mean, it's, um, it, it doesn't seem to fit very neatly in that economic kind of model, but it seems to be a value that many of us kind of want in the system. And I, and I think if you step back and have a look at it, part of the problem is is is, um, is what is is the definition of fairness that the that the um, the inquiry sort of um, come down to. It's a fairly thin kind of concept of, th of fairness. Um, particularly in the context of compulsion on consumers to be involved in the system. And we have an economic system um, that we, we, we sort of narrowed the discussion here to talk about the, the financial system, but consumers outside that in the political system, in the, in the social sphere, for example, have other values about fairness and 
which in, would include participation um, and, and transparency and, and those sorts of um, more, you know, sort of uh, other sort of systemic values, which we're not necessarily talking about in the, in the context of this report. And, and I think um, that's a challenge, particularly where, um, you know, aspects of the system um, are, are perceived to not deliver fairness um, or, um, you know, not to be operating fairly. Um, unless we get the, the, those overall values right about what, you know, how, how we want, um, you know, what, what is the value of uh, consumer participation in the system, um, it makes it very hard to then move on to talk about, well, things like product intervention powers. I mean, how would ASIC know, um, wh you know, whether or not to use a power without reference to a, a deeper concept of fairness? Thanks, Demi. Um, if, if you look around the financial planning world, planners and others involved, are a desire, it's desirable to them to, for financial planning to be recognised as a profession. <coughs> so I think about what do professions generally bring to consumers and, and top of mind for me is that they bring peace of mind from what they deliver. They bring peace of mind to consumers, whether that's uh, you know, the legal profession, the medical profession, whatever. And that's got to be the challenge for us around the financial planning world and, and for me, ASIC and, and the regulators try to drive towards professionalism, but they actually drive into a world of competent advice. And I think it's more up for the professional associations and those that are involved in the profession to actually drive higher standards and higher education and higher learnings through, through their professional bodies. So I think it's a combination uh, that we need here around this, this whole fairness and best interest duty approach that will lead us towards one day seeing financial planning recognised as a profession. But one of the key aspects of that is we actually need to exclude those who don't adhere or don't believe in the same outcomes. And that's been one of the troubles we, we've had in the space and just how quickly we can get to the stage where we have everyone aligned to a professional association and living the standards and ethics of that professional association. We have higher standards focusing on a fiduciary like uh, best interest duty is where we've got to get to. All right, thank you very much. Now, moving seamlessly um, from fairness to uh, financial product governance, that is the financial system inquiries, uh, targeted principles-based product design and distribution obligation. I call that an overarching term, financial product governance. And to its twin, or at least related idea, product intervention powers, which were discussed a bit by Peter Kell over lunch. One of the reasons I put the three ideas in the same sentence is because it was a desire for achieving a greater fairness which led the FSI to recommend these two uh, regulatory steps which are in a sense a really big step change away from the disclosure settings that were set by the Wallace report 20 years ago. And um, it's fairness in the expectations of consumers being met through the design and distribution of a product for them uh, which has been to take Kevin Davis's motoring metaphor a bit further, road tested, performance tested and possibly financial crash tested so that it performs in those stressed conditions the way that the provider, distributor and advisor um, says it will. And so I'd like to open a discussion amongst the panel members now on financial product governance and how that might work and also uh, some commentary on product intervention powers. And I might start with Jenny, who wanted also to relate uh, these things to fairness. Well, 
I just wanted to go back to the fairness question a bit because I thought the FSI summed up fairness in quite a nice, simple statement. They said, um, you know, fairness is about products meeting the end, the, the, sorry, the needs of the end users. So I'd probably add to that products and services meeting consumers' needs. So I think that's a very simple outcome statement. And then I saw that the way that was sort of actioned um, was really through um, the what Timothy's calling product governance, and I quite like that because it's quite a simple way of summing up that long paragraph on um, product accountability, really. So product governance and the product intervention powers. So I think what the particularly the product governance um, recommendation has the power to do, it's it's really what we were hearing in the last session about the link between fairness and culture. And I think um, by requiring um, issuers and distributors to take responsibility for the suitability of their products um, for end consumers is about putting in place systems and processes inside companies that mean that they're focused on delivering fair outcomes to their, to their consumers. So in terms of um, some examples of what this might uh, you know, look like in practice. We, we heard before, sorry, I'm just flicking through, I've got a list of them here. So, you know, in terms of things like, um, you know, the storm financial model, whereby, um, you know, retirees were heavily geared into, you know, it might say that you, you can't design heavily geared products uh, and sell them to retirees who have no um, possibility of offsetting the tax benefits of geared products because they have no sort of real taxable income. Or it might mean um, structured products. There might be some rules around uh, or some conditions or guidance around, um, you know, having to ensure that consumers can understand the risk when they buy these things. So it might mean something like, you know, an online quiz that you have to complete and successfully pass before, um, you know, these products meet the sort of distribution test for you. Um, you know, Opus Prime, you know, the, the report talks about Opus Prime. Now, they were selling very complex products to quite sophisticated clients, but as we discovered when the, the, the matter came undone and hit the courts, you know, a lot of those clients didn't understand the product. So it's about, you know, have the, the, the maker of the products and the services taking responsibility for um, consumer, to ensure that the target market for those products that those consumers understand them and that they meet their needs, that they deliver for consumers in the way consumers expect. And this is not really only about complex products. You know, we've talked a lot about add-on insurance today. You know, that's a relatively simple product that these um, rules would apply to. So I think that's enough for me. Sure. I mean, I, I very much agree to Jenny that I see that recommendation being about product safety, yeah. um, and uh, it, we, it's not. And, and the recommendation is about looking at where in the regulation of financial services there isn't a sufficient protection when it comes to product safety. In fact, in consumer credit, we already have a, a pretty good um, uh, 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 response there in the, the responsible lending obligations, which apply to both um, the lender and any sort of broker or intermediary. Um, to assess whether the product is suits aligns with the individual's requirements and circumstances, considering whether it's going to cause them substantial hardship or not, and to take steps to verify that. Um, so that's the type of obligation I think that's missing in some other areas, like perhaps in uh, the, those wealth areas that I don't have as much experience with, but also in insurance. Um, uh, in fact, insurance is entirely um, devoid of any sort of uh, a product safety uh, protection like that. There is, a, there is an ASIC Act, a fitness for purpose um, provision, and that doesn't give the regulator powers. It's only a, a consumer contractual right, and insurance is exempt from that. So I think there are opportunities to think about across the whole range of financial services um, where the product safety protections can be strengthened. Um, I think one of the things that we can uh, link together here is what the financial system inquiry report called suitability. 
And the whole point, as I understand it, of having these financial product governance obligations is to have a greater certainty that products will be suitable for the target group to whom it is planned to sell them. And I know that we've talked uh, in, in, amongst people who've had an interest in the FSI using the term suitability. But in fact, except in the credit area where there's a responsibility to enter a credit contract with a, a customer unless it is not suitable, suitability is actually an idea that is not terribly familiar in our um, financial services law. In the past, we've talked about um, recommendations of products being appropriate or having a reasonable basis for making the recommendation. But suitability seems to me to be a thicker idea and there's a lot of uh, history around suitability in the US, um, but we're just getting to grips with it as a term and developing a kind of indigenous meaning for it really, um, sort of starting now. And so I might ask Pamela, who's been doing some thinking about suitability and financial products governance and product intervention powers to say a little more about this. Because the whole point of financial product governance and product intervention powers is to look not at individual transactions and the appropriateness of a product for an individual, but to look at classes or target groups or markets. So what we have to think about here is an idea of class suitability. Thanks, Dimity. We've, I've been doing some work with Gail Pearson at Sydney um, University to think about how you might, I hesitate to use the word, operationalise this idea. Um, we think that the right approach on this issue is not so much to give ASIC an intervention power or have ASIC decide whether products are suitable or not or take action if um, products are being directed to the wrong market, but rather to acknowledge that when investors or consumers end up in unsuitable products, there's a loss. And at the moment, that loss is sitting with the individual and their community, for example, Storm. Um, and we think that that loss should sit with the person who originated the product because they're in a better position to control where it ends up. So we then said, well, what's the right juridical model to get to that outcome? Because what we definitely don't want is anything that smacks of anything to do with Chapter 7. And for people who think I'm unreasonable about this, have a look at the FOFA process, right? An idea which in equity is expressed in something like eight words, the best interest duty, was translated in FOFA into over two and a half thousand words, and then we had no legislative certainty around that for, for years. And correct, so you've got, to, you've got to be, it's fine to have these ideas and think, well, maybe a, this is the definition that Gail and I are thinking of, maybe a product's unsuitable if uh, a person who acquires it or the person to whom it's directed couldn't be expected to um, endure any loss that's reasonably foreseeable over the whole investment cycle carried with that product without undue hardship, right? Now that captures storm, that captures those kinds of products that you'd want to capture. And we said, well, you've got to do that in a way that takes into account that we can't do what we do in credit, which is make an individual assessment of the suitability of the product for each borrower. We can't do that in our market. So we think it's better to look to the more robust model around the old section 52 of the Trade Practices Act that says if you engage in misleading and deceptive conduct then the loss sits with you not the person who was on the receiving end of that deceptive conduct. So we say well if you design a product and you um, organise its distribution in such a way that it's reasonably foreseeable that it's going to end up in the hands of this group of people and that target audience couldn't reasonably be expected to absorb any losses that would come from the Behave, when that product behaves as it's intended to over its life, having regard to maybe what's typically in the investment wallet of that type of client, then we think you can design a principle-based rule that overcomes that difficulty that we've got ourselves into with Chapter 7 and FOFA where you're trying to define every concept and it ends up being basically in pretty incomprehensible. So thinking about suitability is about saying, well, first of all, 
it's, it's not enough to say a product's unsuitable because a person suffers an investment loss. I mean, that's investing, or it's not unsuitable because it disappoints their expectations, or... But if it behaves as it's designed to behave, so think about the CDOs that Windsor Caribbean Council bought, I mean, they, they behaved as they were intended to, but it was not reasonable to expect the council to absorb the loss um, in the ordinary course. So it's, we've been playing around, Dimity, with that idea of saying, well, if you think about it in a sort of misleading and deceptive conduct type context and say, who's the product directed to, not who the issuer says it's directed to, but who's it actually being directed at in the manner in which it's being distributed. And then for that type of consumer, could you reasonably expect them to absorb the ups and downs of that product over its life cycle? Um, and if not, then maybe it's unsuitable. And the consequences that flow from that should sit with the issuer and not the person who bought it. Just make a comment on that. I, I, I think that's fine in terms of the, the, um, the approach. One of the problems, though, is it's sort of it's it's at the intent um, sort of level of the of, of the, um, um, the product origination and design that that you really need to be sort of heading this off. It's at the top of the cliff, not the yeah. bottom. And one of the one of the problems that arises is that um, the product issue is often not around at the end of the day to um, to pay the compensation. Um, and uh, um, you know, I think I, I think there's got as that aspect of it w w which we would need to overcome in this space. Yeah, but the the intention is by making the product issuer realise that that consequence is sitting at the end of the process, that you're trying to get them to change their behaviour at the beginning. Yep. Because if you put it in the hands of the regulator, it's not until, I'm sorry, it's not until after you get to the end of that process that you can do anything about it. So, um, so that's why we've really s struggled with this issue about saying, well, given that everybody, you know, I can put a derivative into a portfolio and it can be either suitable or unsuitable depending on what else is in that portfolio. So how do we overcome that and make this a regulatory rule that's going to be sensible and workable and not depend on the individual circumstances of each client? Yeah. And it's, it's di like I'm frankly acknowledging that it's, it's very difficult, but we can't just assume that by making a statement of intent, well, you know, advisors should act in the best interest of their client. Well, guess what? They've always had that obligation. But to assume that some person in the parliamentary draftsman's office is going to be able to translate that into something which is nimble and usable and actually changes people's behaviour yep. at the beginning of the process is really challenging. I, I, I think part of, of this too yeah. is about, um, from, the, from the perspective of the advisor and the experience of a lot of the product collapses over the last sort of seven, to 10 years, um, the, the accountability all ends up at the, at, at the advisor end of the chain. And, and you know, that makes my members really um, upset in terms of having to bear the, the cost of the outcome. But, but also, it's, it's not good. Do you want to good. talk about commissions on agribusiness products? Cause well, well <laughs> uh, you know, over the years, they've been incentivised to, to, yeah. to distribute this product. But, and we've changed that commission model. Um, but, but one of the problems is, even from the advisor point of view, um, in terms of product design and the intent of the product and the business models behind the product, that's, that's often um, incredibly opaque. Mm. Um, and it's very difficult to advise on these products. It's very difficult for research houses, for example, to get the right information to make good comparative um, sort of statements and, and, and um, recommendations to advisors about the products in the first place. Um, and so standardisation at that design level um, you know, particularly around the intended use of the product, the intended audience, um, um, the intended end customer, um, I, think, I think would be really helpful because it will actually drive um, the right behaviour in terms of product design. So that leads me to another question that we have before us, which is how white might we introduce these principle-based financial product governance obligations for design and distribution? Because it seems to me that if we got that right, a lot of the things that you are concerned about um, and that Pamela's mentioned m might be easier to regulate for. So does anybody want to take that one up? Let, let, let me just sort of pick up on a point I made before. I, I don't think it's up for some bureaucrat to, to, to write out what best interest duty is and for us to, it's up for the profession. Yeah. It, it's up for the, the Financial Planning Association with its code of ethics. It's up for those who want to be part of a profession to do it and to enforce it. 
The trick then gets to who, those who don't live in that world, what do we do with them? Now, for me, it's off with their heads to put on the gates of the city, but you probably can't do that now. But we've got to do something to exclude them. So when consumers are dealing with those people, they know they're not dealing with someone who adheres to the standards of financial planning as a profession around the globe. And that's our challenge. To, when consumers are sitting down dealing with someone, they know the standard of the person or the group they're dealing with. Is it, it's true at the moment, isn't it, that 60% of financial advisors work in an advice firm that's owned by one of the big five financial conglomerates? It's, it's around 60%, yeah. yeah. And, and I'll, I'll make the point. We need models across the board, be the small person on the corner with their own licence or a large person working in, a, in an institution to adhere to the standards and to deliver first class advice. Most professions out there have those models. There are lawyers who work by themselves and lawyers who work for the large firms. And we need consumers to have that choice to go to the model they feel most comfortable with. The model should deliver advice in a best interest duty form. Mm. That's, that's what it should do. I think part of this is, is about actually helping people to advise too, to give them um, some standards about what's in products, how, the, how things are represented, um, because at the end of the day, if advisors are doing their job and their, their interests are aligned with consumers, they will pull po products apart and they, will, they know the products that, that don't work, that are going to be a disaster and they won't want to be uh, associated with them, particularly if, if they're, they're interested in, and uh, are, are ultimately aligned with, with consumers. Mm. Well, we seem to have... An unprecedented moment of quiet here. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that might suggest that it's time to open the floor to your questions. And there's a UNSW law person jumping into the breach already. Uh, can we have a question from you, Dr. Donald? It's not a Dorothy Dixer, actually. Um, as I was listening to, to your. We comments, can't hear you, I'm sorry. Oh, you keep, is that better? You must right. Have. As I was listening to. I can't look at you and also. So I just have to look down, sorry. Um, as I was listening to what you were speaking, what this thing's been said over the last hour and a half or so, it occurs to me that the language that we use is actually less neutral than we might think. And so we talk about now financial products, we talk about consumers, and that puts us in mind of a certain mindset about how we should regulate, how we should protect. If we think about some of the financial services that are produced, in some contexts that people are called members, other contexts they're called policyholders, borrowers, investors. As soon as you start to think about them in those terms, you start to open up the possibility that we might want to think about what rights and expectations they have in a slightly different frame than if we simply take Wallace and just cast everybody as a consumer. Similarly, when we talk about products, we often distinguish product from advice, but that just allows people to kind of cut and dice the various things that are going on in the relationship in such a way as to, as to manipulate the kind of the regulatory treatment. And I wonder whether maybe more attention to the impact of the language that we use might open up other alternatives in the same way that we, you know, we think about environmental protection. We don't think about the people who live in our, in, our, in our cities as being consumers. We think of them as being residents. And, we, and I just wonder whether perhaps we're getting a little bit, our imaginations are being constrained by this apparent neutrality around consumers and products and services and maybe, maybe what we need is actually to think differently or tr try different models and see if that gives us some, some new ideas. Can I comment? Um, I, I think um, and Dimity's written on this subject of, around the idea of financial citizenship because I think um, that is a different term to talk about in terms of consumer participation. Um, it sort of brings values across from the political system in terms of fairness, um, some, some ideas of justice as, as well in the system. Um, and perhaps changes the sort of settings that you might have in terms of the overall system goals and objectives. Um, yeah, um, look, it's not one I thought, oh, sorry, thanks, Steve. It's not one I've thought a lot about, but I just sort of thinking as you raised it, um, you know, the SSI used the term end users. Now, it's pretty sort of funny language, but, but what it does cover a lot of things, you know, consumers where like they're at the end of, the chain um, and they sort of there's a utility focus of this product so I'm not sure that you know you know this notion of citizen it's quite a powerful notion of um, 
you know, responsibilities. And I think that is something that the FSI grappled with, that, you know, consumers have responsibility to, you know, take responsibility for the products they purchase. But it also introduced this notion of, um, you know, we've got advisors who have to take responsibility through the best interest duty. And I think the recommendation, going back to the previous discussion on um, product governance, says, well, actually, it's fine for consumers to take responsibility when all the other parts of the chain, they're at the bottom, when all the parts above them are taking responsibility, then it's appropriate for consumers to take responsibility too. So that's a tangent to your question, <laughs> but uh, there you go. Can I, can I add to that? Sorry, I, I guess that I, I just wanted to add around the, um, uh, the view of consumer as just a, a sort of a utility, as something from a consumer organisation we have a bit of, uh, we contest, I guess. We come from, a, I guess, a consumer rights perspective and there are well articulated consumer rights that consumer organisations subscribe to. You know, they were first announced by the AFK in the 60s around the right to safety, the right to information, the right to choice, the right to be heard. Um, and they've added things like the right to address to that. And I think that um, consumers uh, can be seen uh, in that context and that, that's exactly what this FSI inquiry is trying to do to deliver on many of those rights. Can I just say something too, sorry? Yeah, sure. yeah so I just, I just wonder if the conversation is different too when we're talking about people who choose to consume and people who are forced to consume. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is an interesting question that you raise um, because we have members of superannuation funds, we have shareholders in companies, um, they do have some rights to participate in the conversation around the, um, uh, the entity in which they are uh, holding rights um, in relation to their economic interest. I think the end user term has come into play because so many more of the financial interests that we now acquire are truly end user. We don't see ourselves uh, in consuming financial interests anymore so much as somebody who is going to trade those interests on the stock exchange, for example. We take them and we hold them and there's no secondary market in them because one of the views in the past has been that you don't need the full panoply of consumer protection in the financial services area because you can simply sell your interests in a liquid market. And that has really changed. So one of the things that I've been concerned about over the last decade or so is the idea that the relationship between a consumer and an investor has got us slightly tangled up. Uh, investors are in a small sense a joint venturer with the issuer of the product in taking a return for the risk. And I can accept that in relation to other kinds of financial interests that you might take, perhaps more like insurance products, that they are more like white goods or cars or computers where you don't know what's in there, you renew them fairly regularly and there's no secondary market in them. And a lot of the consumer ideas have really been translated to the financial services sector very successfully. Consumer dispute resolution is perhaps the leading example and um, some of the considerations that we've been talking about today are um, coming through thick and fast behind. Product intervention powers, of course, kind of have a slight taste of product recalls. Not really, if you're going to do labelling warnings and things like that, but you know that's where we're getting to. And with financial um, product governance, we're beginning to talk quite literally about crash testing or performance testing financial products for consumers so that when the market drops by 25%, we've got a pretty good idea what the product's going to do. And that is altering the equation in relation to the risk return setup. So um, these are kind of middle order conceptual, more abstract ideas, but I think they, we have to think about them as we implement the financial services um, recommendations. Well, that's enough from me. Anyone else? Yes, I have someone from this side. Jeff Warren, uh, from CIFA. I'm going to pick up on what Scott, having worked with Scott for quite a while, and something Hazel said, and that's around the, the way we're looking at this problem. 
And the fact is, in a lot of the, uh, in super in particular, a lot of people don't choose. They don't make the choice. Somebody else makes the choice or directs it for them. And when we talk about looking at people as consumers, we actually miss a big part of the system and whether they're being looked after. Um, and this harks back to something Scott has written years ago about, and he was alluding to about how do you view people as consumers or do you view them as members? And in many cases, they are in fact members. And, it, and really, it's, it's, it's uh, it, should we be focusing on whether the people who make the choice or the direct the choice are doing their job well? Um, and when we talk about it, are we disclosed enough and all the rest of it? We miss all, all that. Um, we have touched on that in one area, I think, when we talk about advice, because advisors do direct people in making choices. And that even goes right into SMS, where a lot of them will rely on the advisor. So I just want to see what the panel sort of thinks about, about that. Are the, are the people who make the choice in the system, which are advisors, they're the employers, and they're actually probably the unions, and then the trustees when you go through the work stream? You know, are they doing the right thing by consumers? Is that it, that that side of the side working correctly? I think it sort of comes back to, you know, um, the issue about how you value the, the people that on the other side of the equation. Um, from the from the profession's perspective, we like to talk about clients, it's a, and that's a subtly different relationship to um, a relationship with a customer or a, or a consumer. Uh, just to target the member comment, I, I, I tend to agree, and, and one of our challenges is to get people more engaged as a member with their superannuation. Most are in the default options, as you know, um, and in truth, the default options, while it's a good starting point, doesn't suit a lot of their personal circumstances. And I think it's really going to be up to the, the trustees of the superannuation funds and the employers to, in the future, have an education program where at least we can tailor make that superannuation scheme to suit the individual who's involved. You know, um, personally, I, I use choice in my fund. I'm turning 60 this year. I would hate to be in defensive options just because of, of my preference. You know, if, if I allowed to stay in a, in a default fund, I would have been moved towards more defensive options where, you know, I don't think I'm going to live to 150 like Joe said, but, you know, I think I've got a fair time left and I want to be in, in more balanced style funds. And that's, uh, I, I, you know, we've got to get people engaged with their super, and it's a challenge. It's like financial literacy, it's hard. They're not interested until they can get a, a, generally about, when they get about one year's salary in super, they tend to take a bit more notice at it, is what I find. Oh, well, I mean, there's a lot of issues in super, but in terms of the, you know, the agents who work on behalf of members or consumers in um, super funds, well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of legal obligations around that. Trustees have to act in the best interest of members, as do the advisors. But the, actually, the gap I think in the super space, where is in the employer space, because um, there are actually no obligations on employers to choose the best default fund um, for their members at the moment. We've got this system through Fair Work Australia, and there's discussion about opening it up. But I think one of the dangers, if if that is opened up, is you know, the, the super system, there are a lot of agents who act on behalf of consumers and they have obligations to act in consumers' best interests, but employers have no obligations in the current system. Yeah, I was going to make a related point. It's something Dimity and I have talked about and we haven't come quite to a landing on it yet, but um, we always talk about the fact that, that the individual member of a superannuation fund doesn't have any choice about putting the money in, and so that should affect how we think about protecting those people or, or regulating that sector. But, of course, there's an enormous public interest in that contribution as well. So every cent that's sitting in somebody's self-managed superannuation fund, I've, every dollar, I've put 30 cents of that in there. And so this question about whether, well, if it's superannuation sourced money, if it's money that's had this tax treatment applied to it, should people have the full autonomy to take that off and give it to you know, Manny Casamatas, or should we actually say, well, do you know what, for that money, maybe we need to constrain people's freedom of choice and protect the public's interest in maintaining the investment that we make through the tax system. It's not a very fashionable idea, mostly because people don't like the thought of having their choices constrained. And we had an amazing experience at ASIC where somebody wrote to their local member of parliament and went all the way up to Chris Bowen when he was minister and came back down to us and they were complaining because um, as a retail investor, they weren't allowed to access a Thai 
bucket shop um, because they, the person wasn't licensed in Australia to provide financial advice. And they were, they were, this complainant was absolutely convinced that all of us rich lawyers were doing that on purpose to deny them access to this wonderful money-making opportunity. So talk about behavioural economics. The things that drive people's behaviours are very strange sometimes. But we haven't really talked about this idea about whether we need to put constraints around the investment of superannuation system money, including in the decumulation phase, to reflect the public's contribution to that nest egg. I just want to say that it's not just superannuation that gets quite large tax concessions. So to take that to its logical conclusion, you know, we'd be looking at investment in your own home and we'd be looking at negative gearing and a whole range of other things as well. That's true. With but discretionary saving though, I mean I can I can take sorry, I can take my discretionary savings down to Star City and <laughs> you know, like nobody has any problem with that. So the fact that we're trying to have one outcome for all parts of the sector, you know, maybe we should say, you know what, I'll take my foot off your neck and if you want to go and spend your own money at the casino, that's fine, or if you want to buy contracts, the difference, or it's nothing to do with me, but maybe, you know, when you're talking about retirement savings or maybe it's a different outcome, and, and you don't get any flavour of that in Murray at all, there's sort of no discussion about whether the one-size-fits-all model is actually the right approach, and it really comes back to what Scott's saying about, you know, this generic term consumer drives us to think we need the same answer in all contexts and maybe we don't. And maybe the development of um, product governance rules and possibly the implementation of product intervention powers will elaborate those differences. Now there was a question over here, yes. No, uh, there it is. Um, Peter Carroll, I'm an actuary. Um, and um, I just want to pick up something that um, Hazel said. If 40% of the population can't explain what interest, inflation and diversification are, when you look at the financial service retail products, um, whether it's superannuation or insurance or investment products, th there's no hope, uh, it seems to me, for the vast majority of people to have any understanding without the advice of a planner. And I mean, these products are designed to mix risk components, investment components, um, and are bundled, and, and they have what the industry calls bells and whistles added on. And in many cases, these products are designed to facilitate the job of the planner in, in tailoring them to the individual. The problem is, and it's been, this is the problem I have seen in my entire actuarial career, um, going back longer than I really want to say, more than 50 years, 50, 40 years since I was a student. And that is that if A and B are doing a deal and the planner is saying, I'm advising A, but B is paying them, no amount of fiddling around with the law or the wording or whatever is going to overcome that fundamental conflict of interest. There's no other way that, I mean, you might be able to overcome it with very moral people. So there's a fundamental need for pla planning that our system is bedeviled and has been all my life by this um, conflicted problem. And it seems to me that recommendation four up there really trumps all the others if you, if you really want to make a significant change. This seems to me to be the elephant in the room here and I'd like to hear what each of the panellists has to say. I mean, so long as suppliers are paying commissions to planners or paying them in some way or other, whether they're investment products, insurance products, superannuation products or whatever, all of these... Uh, people without the financial skills, of which we all agree there are vast majority of people, are never going to get properly served. Would you further to you, Steve? I, 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 I agree. I, the last bastion of commissions is the life insurance world. Um, and I'm hoping that the report from John Trowbridge, who's been here at the, this conference I was talking to him outside, will be the start of change. There's definitely change going to happen in that that area. You, you recently saw a report from ASIC 
which showed basically uh, one third of the advice they looked at was flawed because of that, that, that position. And when I talk about a profession, it's inconceivable that you'd have three doctors lined up and you'd go into one of those doors and not get great advice. You'd well, can I just say, would, would, you, would you take tax advice from an accountant who got a commission from the tax office? <laughs> I couldn't imagine the tax office <laughs> well, paying, paying commission. Would yeah. You? Yeah. Well, well but let, let me say, I do use a financial planner and, he's, he, and his company's an AMP financial planner. I've used them for many, many years and they do my risk insurance as well. Uh, in their particular circumstance, they rebate the commissions and I work on advice fees with them. So there is a model that does work and it can work. I think we're on the, uh, on, on the sort of stage of the change happening in that area from John's report and what's been happening, it, it has to happen. Um, it, it's, it's quite interesting, I'm, I'm involved around the world on, on a financial planning standards board which looks after the CFP mark around the world. Uh, it's commissions is being moved away from in most parts of the world, probably with the exception of the US which is just strange, it's going to stay there for they, 30 years they tell me it'll be around or longer. But it is a push around the world, South Africa, the UK, India, places like that. And the insurance or risk products, if you like, insurance products seem to be the last bastion, but it'll happen. Um, and there needs to be a transition to make it happen as quickly as possible. No, super products and investment products. Uh, There's no commission. There's no commission on them no. anymore. Mm -hmm. Hasn't well, been commissioned for, well at our company, I can tell you, hasn't been commissioned since 2010. Yeah, and commissions, and, and well, commissions, commissions are going under the law. Yeah, under the law, they've been, been gone since, I think, 1st of July last year, wasn't yeah, it, Jenny? I think yeah. they were. But that's yeah. for new products. If you, you know, there are consumers, if you don't move out of your old products, you're still going to be in commission-banging products. But I think there's another dimension to what you're talking about, and that's also, you know, what we call the insider jargon, vertical integration, whereby the product manufacturers own the advisors who sell them. And I think, you know, what the solution here is about the move to a genuinely independent advice um, profession. And while ever you've got the sort of the vertical integration, I think that's going to be a barrier. I mean, people talk about it as the thermonuclear option in, in, in you know, creating an independent advice industry. But I suspect we're heading to a situation, you know, we've got the Australia, uh, this Commonwealth Bank, we've got NAB, we've got... I think ANZ, um, you know, Macquarie's been there. So, you know, we must be hitting a point where the advice arms are sort of, sorry, Steve, becoming a bit of a, a reputational liability for some of those companies and whether they may in fact drive, um, you know, separation in the business model. So I think, you know, the answer is towards an independent advice profession and I think the professional associations have a role and, and the industry players have a role in, in bringing that about. But I think, you know, consumers want to go and get advice from someone who they know is working for their interests and have no other allegiance. They don't want consumers to be sitting in the Commonwealth Bank or under the license the, uh, of, of ANP. They want an, in who is a product manufacturer? They want an independent respond. advisor. <laughs> Sorry. I've, I've agreed everything with you said today except that, Jenny. Um, <laughs> we, we actually talk to consumers naturally, and so do you, I know you do. And there are a, a large percentage of people out there who like the fact that their advice is backed by an institution. Um, going to that institution doesn't mean they will get products from that institution necessarily. Um, and you have a look at the approved product lists, which are a risk mitigant for a number of licensees, and I can quote ours, and there is a plethora of products on them from many, many manufacturers. Um, I think there's too many to tell you the truth because of the cost you spend in research and looking after those products is, is, is too high. So I, I think we need choice, as I said before. Um, if you went to an, in, let's say, all of the banks and the AMP tomorrow threw them all out in the street and said, you're all independently licensed, I would put it to you that standards would plummet. They would plummet overnight. So we need a model that looks Pretty after both the small, the small and the large but they have to operate in the best interest world and make sure that whenever they give advice, it's in the consumer's interest and the consumer is put first and the consumer is in a better position. The consumer will remember what <laughs> different terms are. Can I answer that? I mean, um, commissions are gone in investment and insurance, um, investment and superannuation. Um, and business models have had to change for advisors. Um, and 
that, that is probably the most fundamental change that the industry's gone through in the, in the last five years. Um, people have had to completely rethink how they organise their business um, from one where they are getting paid by the, the um, product issuer, or the, um, that side of the, the equation, to one where they have to be paid by the consumer. And they're only as good as the engagement they have with their clients and the ability to be able to sustain that engagement over the long term. Um, and ultimately, that align, that, that change in business model fundamentally realigns um, the interests of the advisor, the interests of, of, of the owners of those small high street financial planning firms with those of their clients. And that's, that's, what, that, that's the area um, that's, that's really gonna generate the values about you know, going forward in, in terms of the system. Um, that will support their clients. Um, consumers are looking for someone on their side in a complex financial world. That's that's where that's that's the part of the market that's going to really drive um, consumer interests into the rest of the system and and force changes in the way the rest of the system happens from the bottom up. Did you want to oh, just my point was slightly tangential, but I, I think that uh, one thing. That we, we put it forward to the FSI that I don't think was picked up was the regulation of advice and sales is probably too connected to the actual product. So, for example, we see um, uh, ex-mortgage brokers now out there advising people on um, debt negotiation and credit repair and um, all, all these things that don't require any sort of licence because they're not a regulated product. And that uh, uh, develops new risks for consumers. And likewise, in financial advisors, ex-financial advisors moving into property advice where um, property advice, again, falls outside the regulatory framework. And, and I think that that area is going to be um, something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a comment about the um, uh, skills of the financial advisors. You know, so 40% of the general population can't do three fairly simple tasks. Uh, we need to make sure that, the, that we have quality financial advisors and there's certain minimum levels of education across the board so that I can go to a financial advisor and be confident that, that they can uh, add up, multiply, divide and diversify. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely more than that. <laughs> How beautifully put. Um, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say, um, we sometimes ask whether vertically integrated or um, issuer-owned advisory firms are in fact just light from a long dead star, and some of us think maybe they are. Um, it's true that... Um, Commissions have been abolished as from the 1st of July last year, uh, but that's only forward-looking, and the revenue for the financial advice industry is $5 billion in revenue in the advice industry in Australia every year. 40% of that last year came from products that were still um, having commission around them. And as I say, the top five issuer groups, so the four banks and AMP, control 60% of the advisors and about 80% of the clients. So. Even though we can talk about the lots of small independent fee-for-service firms, the ability to move these professional standards and so on, you know, you've got a big chunk of the industry in five players. Interestingly enough, they're not all called by the institution name, and the clients often don't realise that the advisor that they're dealing with is in fact working for a firm that's owned by an issuer, and that's a, a separate... I mean, there's lots of complexity around that, but um, I think as, as we move this debate forward, it's going to really come down to the question of whether, given how complex the advice that um, Steve's team are increasingly being asked to give and the very serious consequences flow from that advice, how are you going to charge enough money for the business still to be capable of, of being carried forward? Because at some point, if you can't, you know, if it's no longer a, ch a distribution channel and therefore adding value to the business and it's just a fee-for-service business, how are we going to get the consumers or the um, clients to the point where they're willing to pay the real value of the advice that they get? They pay now, they just don't yeah, know they, it. Yeah, they, they, they don't understand that they're being paid but because the disclosure that they get is not adequate to give rise to effective right. consent, but that's a separate issue. I'll, let, let, I'll address that then. Yeah. I'm glad here it's my team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, I think the, the provision of advice is too complex and we have you know, statement of advice which you think people are charging by the kilo yeah. when the way they're produced. Um, if you think about it for middle Australia, whatever you want to call them, paying off your home loan, getting your debt and your budget in place, putting as much as you can into your super and having insurance for contingencies is pretty much 
the financial plan for middle Australia. We should be able to provide that for 500 bucks. Yeah. And that's what we've got to be able to do. Yeah. And planners, you know, in a world where planning is seen as there's a lot more confidence in the system, people will come to them, they'll be able to do that quickly and, and efficiently. So I think there's that, and I think technology combined with it can help. It will certainly happen, as I said, you know, I, I, said I know a lot of planners who have been working on fee-based models for a long time. And it, and it can happen, but there needs to be a transition, and the transition is happening. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on that very optimistic note, thank you very much. <laughs> now, there are two lovely individuals who have questions, Nicholas Mellis and Dr Hugh Brakey over here, but I know that Justin O'Brien will never forgive me if I don't wrap this session up now. And so I invite Nicholas and Hugh to come up and talk to the panel personally um, if they'd like to. To Steve Helmich from AMP, to Jenny Mack from the Consumers Centre, for, to Professor Pamela Hanahan from many different places, including <laughs> the University of Melbourne, my colleague uh, from UNSW, Professor uh, Hazel Bateman, to uh, John Bacon from the Financial Planning Association, and to Jareth Brody, all the way from Melbourne, from Consumer Action. Thank you all very much for doing so much work. You've no idea how much work I made them do. Um, and we're terribly grateful to have had this really lively exchange. And will you help me thank them in the usual way?